Hi everybody and welcome to this webinar on the theme of educational leadership. I'm Sharon Parkinson, I'm a Publishing Development Manager and co-host representing Emerald Publishing. This webinar has been developed in partnership between the International Higher Education Teaching and Learning Association, or HETL, as it's more commonly known, and Emerald Publishing. So to find out more about either of these organisations, um, just look out for a follow-up email after the event, because there will be links there through to resources and information if you, if you want it. Just a couple of housekeeping and practical points before we start. All delegates are muted, so if you have any questions, which we do encourage, then please use the questions box on the panel to the right-hand side of your screen. We'll try and address all the questions at the end of the session. And if you have a question that's for a specific panelist, then can you please be sure to flag their name in the question box along with your question? I'm going to now hand over to Professor Audrey Falk, who is the Director of the Community Engagement Programme and Chair of the Department of Applied Human Development and Community Studies at Merrimack College in the US. She's also um, Country Director for the Northeast US region for HETL. So Audrey is going to moderate today's session. So over to you, Audrey. Thank you so much, Sharon. Welcome everyone to the webinar. The content of today's session focuses on educational leadership, which of course is a critical component to academic success for all students. And when well done, it positively affects students and staff morale, performance of students and outcomes. I'm joined by four for panelists today to explore the main challenges affecting school leaders. We will be discussing how leaders can structure decision making to be more effective and create an organizational culture that aligns with their vision and mission and how they can create an inclusive and supportive culture for other leaders in schools. Our panelists are based in four different countries covering three continents, so I'm sure we'll get rich and varied views and experiences throughout the session. Our panelists are Dr. Paul Campbell, Research Assistant Professor of Education Policy and Leadership at the Education University of Hong Kong, Dr. Lorenzo Garcia, who is the Assistant Superintendent of Equity and Inclusion in Revere Public Schools, Ruth Lusmore, a Research Fellow at the University of Warwick and Lecturer in Educational Leadership at the National Institute of Teaching and Education, and Rupa Sen, former Head of Bangalore International School and Certified Lead Auditor for ISO 2018, Coach and Mentor. We will start by asking each of the panelists to share a bit about themselves and their work in educational leadership practice and research. And we'll start today with Ruth. Thank you, Audrey. Um, so I'm Ruth Lusmore. Uh, I started my career in education as a primary school class teacher in the suburbs of London, England. And I was um, fortunate enough to be quickly taken under the wing of school leadership and get into the senior leadership team. So from there, I became a deputy head of a school in central London and then spent five years as a head teacher of a, another school in central London, an all through school with two head teachers. Um, two years ago, I left uh, the joys of being in school um, to go into research and academia. And I've been teaching on an MA in educational leadership, which works directly with senior leaders. So people still at the coalface as well as being a research fellow at the University of Warwick. Um, I'm still a school governor and a trustee of schools, and I'm still trying to be as involved as possible with teachers. And I run an, a teaching conference. Um, and, and really, my research is interested in the direct experience of school leaders and creating a culture for their teachers to improve their practice. Um, but I think I'll probably be leaning much more on my experience of direct school leadership within this session. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that in introduction, Ruth, and we'll move on to Paul. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Paul Campbell. Um, and up until two weeks ago, I was vice principal of a large international primary school here in Hong Kong. It's my two week anniversary entering the world of academia. Um, I started off as a primary school teacher back in Scotland in one of the new towns in between Glasgow and Edinburgh. 
and spent some time teaching in Australia and Spain and then moved to Hong Kong six years ago uh, where I became quite interested in the role of different forms of leadership, positional and non-positional within school systems in particular. Um, and that's where I pursued a doctoral degree, which was looking at the leadership of collaboration for educational change. And this is where my research interest still lies, trying to explore how educational change is secured in varied systems and different school contexts, the role of different types of leadership within that, and what the varied influences and drivers are within some complex systems globally. Um, I'm a member of um, ICSI, a really important organisation to my development throughout my career, the International Congress for School Effectiveness and Improvement. Um, I'm a board member of ICSI as well, and that's been a really important organisation that's helped me look at the intersection as well. Another area of interest, the intersection between research policy and practice and how that helps us make sense of some of the complex challenges we face as leaders in different spaces within education as well. And I'm delighted to be with everybody this evening. So thank you so much, Paul. Lorenzo, can you please introduce yourself? Oh, Lorenzo, uh, we're not hearing you now. Thank you. Hi, I, um, I'm Lorenzo Garcia. I, uh, I was born and raised on the on the islands of Cape Verde, a small country located west of Africa. I've been all over the world, including Russia, Ukraine, many other parts of the world. Um, I have a, uh, a doctor in education leadership, and I have been a principal of a, you know, of a high school in Massachusetts for eight years. Um, I am a two uh, times gold medal uh, for best schools uh, in the US for some transformative changes and curriculum development and reforms, school reforms. Um, uh, prior to that, I was a classroom teacher as well. And um, since 2018, I have been uh, the executive director of account data and accountability for the district. Currently, I do the work of um, assistant superintendent of you know, equity and inclusion, primarily focusing on looking for systems of uh, systems and barriers that uh, uh, make it difficult for um, students to access um, a meaningful and rigorous curriculum in our school district, and to ensure that we have policies and practice in place that do not are not discriminatory, you know, in nature, and make sure that. Um, you know, uh, the system is a little bit more inclusive, um, more practice oriented and uh, more equitable to ensure that families and students have access to um, a meaningful and, um, uh, you know, 21st kind of education. So that's what I do um, um, right now. Um, obviously, uh, this is my third year in this post, in this position, and um, I look forward to share my insights, my perspectives uh, and my experience with you and also learn with you today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. Rupa, I'd like to invite you to introduce yourself. Okay, so my name is Rupa Sen, and I represent a billion people country, India. I come from India. And uh, my leadership practice evolved, but I started my life as a teacher, a very passionate teacher, because teaching is something that I've always enjoyed and I wanted to be a teacher. Um, from being a passionate teacher, I transitioned myself to be a coordinator, taking enough and more responsibility, move on to be the school head. And now it's 30 years in my journey. I've been working in a variety of schools, small schools in small cities, big metropolitan um, schools in big metropolitan, various curriculum, for example, in India, we've got the Indian curriculum. I've worked in the Indian curriculum. I've been in the National Development for Curriculum uh, for Indian schools. From there, I moved to working with IB schools and Cambridge schools. And I've been certified by the IB and the Cambridge training. Um, and now I'm in Bangalore, which is, uh, they say, the Silicon Valley of India. And it's here that I've been working with a different kind of school, schools that are run by parents. It's a parent-run non-profit school, but I was a former principal. And at the moment, I have uh, taken myself out of leadership. I'm doing things that I want to do. So my life is all about changing and breaking patterns. And from leadership, 
Right now, I'm working on uh, voluntary uh, teaching back once again, and I'm learning to play tennis. So, which means being a leader, you can still have time for yourself and do things that you always wanted to do, never had the time. And that's a way you can break patterns. So now I'm a tennis player and I learn tennis. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rupa. And thank you to all of our panelists for those wonderful introductions. It is extraordinary to hear uh, your experience. And I'm looking forward to learning from each of you uh, during this hour. Uh, so I'd like to begin with the first question. And for this question, we'll take the reverse order that we had before. So we'll start with first um, Rupa and then Paul. No, no, then Lorenzo, then Paul, and then Ruth. Um, and the question is, why is school leadership so very important? What are the impacts of effective educational leadership? And conversely, what can be the impacts of ineffective leadership? So again, we'll start with you, Rupa. Okay, so um, to me, I think leaders are like architects of great building. They create a compelling vision underpinning the core values, which are non-negotiable, and basic foundation of the schools are based on those values. They ensure that they create a dynamic community which has a culture that is resilient. Post-COVID, it's become all the more relevant that leaders take this responsibility to create a culture where everybody feels belong everybody feels welcome values are therefore becoming more and more relevant and in our world which is fast changing every day we see our students are coming up with uh, you know with things that we were not we we didn't see that before for example technology technology is something that is dominant in our lives now ai is very much leading the way and so we need to keep on reinventing the wheel discover redesign the way we teach because we can't teach them or the teachers cannot teach them the way they they, they were taught yesteryears or else we drop their dream today's children are very different from what we saw when we were young and even the past decade so to me it's it's the, the the leader is very critical, very pivotal in building up the foundation of this huge building. And if you ask me, what's an effective leader? Who's an effective leader? An, an effective leader will definitely have a compelling, clear vision, a clear path where to go. Will definitely be motivating and inspiring the team because that's the big picture that everybody's looking at. And you need to be a team player to be an effective leader because in today's world, again, I repeat, post-COVID, people, the emotions of people and children and parents are becoming very, very important. So you need to be more of a people's leader to be effective. You need to give weightage to understand people's emotion and, and do things that matter them most. And I'm a school leader uh, for K-12 school. We've been looking at the child's interest. Yes, the child's interest is important. It's equally important that we look into the other segments of the community, which are the teachers. So an effective leader will have a healthy balance between every other responsibility, make sure that the school is pressing forward with innovative technology, creative way of decision making, resolving problem and not, not letting them grow because the moment you push them under the rug uh, and the decisions are delayed it leads into um, ineffectiveness of leadership thank you so much rupa lorenzo we'd love to hear your response sure uh, to me um uh, a school an effective school leader uh, is someone who embodies um, the values of the community, sets the vision for the for the school, and understands where teachers are coming from, 
where different stakeholders, uh, not just teachers, but also parents, students, uh, particularly in, a, in an environment where you have different perspectives, experiences, um, you know, colliding with each other. Let's face it, schools by, uh, you know, by the, the essence, in other words, uh, by the very nature of, uh, of, of what, you know, uh, the organization is all about. Um, sometimes I say this and sometimes people get a little bit upset, but I will tell you that school is a place of political contestation. There's no doubt about it. You will find teachers from different backgrounds, different perspectives, with different values. You will find students with different perspectives, values, perspectives, and parents, and so on and so forth. So as a leader, you need to be able to navigate those differences and to ensure that everyone is included in the decision-making process. There are times that you set the tone, no doubt about it. You are the leader. But ultimately, setting the tone alone will not do the trick. You really need to bring, bring people along and make sure that vision transforms into reality. So uh, to me, there are five distinct principles of leadership that I strongly believe in. One is being a leader who is a culture builder. You work with teachers, you work with families, you build a culture that really respects everyone, takes everyone's ideas and perspectives into account. Obviously, ultimately, you are the leader. You take those things, you mold it in a way that will make sure that people feel welcome and they feel supported as they do their work. The second principle of leadership is to, it's basically um, kind of, they, yeah, they are kind of interdependent, which is empowering people. Uh, you need to ensure that people are empowered. Uh, don't come out as a professorial or somebody that really knows everything. You really need to be in the trenches and give people, delegate people, delegate responsibility and trust people in the process. Trust and uh, is such a thing that if you don't have in a school, then uh, you might, uh, you know, you need to work on the on trust so that people really can believe in you, what you try, you're telling them and do the work in an in effective way. The, the third one is leader as, a, uh, as one that executes things properly. Um, in other words, you need to ensure that you are there working with others to make sure that the vision gets implemented. And that's the part of your routine. I would say that most of your time as a school leader in a school, you spend about, a good leader spends about 50 to 60% of his time or her time executing things. I can I, I tend to believe that, you know, always I tend to believe that theory is important, but you want to make sure that your actions are practice oriented. Because if you are not practice oriented, then the results will be catastrophic for your school culture and also for your, your organization in general. And the last one probably is engagement. To engage, you need to be together with teachers. You got to roll your sleeves and be in the trenches what are you working on a curriculum development? What are you working on a particular piece of, uh, of, um, of uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, common planning time, or in many places they call, you know, uh, you know, uh, PLG time, which is a professional learning group where teachers meet, they strategize, they prepare for the day, they prepare a lesson, and so on and so forth. You as a principal, or if you have time, not but you have to have, you have to make time. You're gonna be there roll your sleeves, show them that you are leading the way, you're working with them, and be part of the team. I heard, I think, Rupa saying that you need to be a team player. That's absolutely true. I don't see our work being done without building a strong relationship, a meaningful relationship that goes both ways. That goes towards students, towards parents, toward the community, and towards our teachers. So you gotta be in trenches working with them, engage in the work, and show them that you care you there is because you care. Sometimes I hear this word a lot, uh, many times, or I'm busy, I'm doing some bureaucratic work. No, as a leader, you got to make time to be there. There's no such a thing as be being busy. Busy is a cliche that's been used in education, many other places, uh, and it's some. It's a word that I always am against it and basic saying, look, we all have responsibilities. Let's do, it, do this together. Put the word busy aside because it's a cliche that's killing education. So those are the some of the remarks and some of the perspectives that I'd like to share with all of you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lorenzo, for sharing your perspective on effective and ineffective educational leadership. And we'll move on to Paul. Yeah, well, it's been great to hear some of these perspectives already. And I think the, the question that it takes me back to, which is not necessarily the question you may have asked, but it's related to it, is the idea around what does it actually mean to lead to be a leader and to exercise leadership? And I think these are the three questions that I would regularly come back to in a school context, but also from a research perspective as well, in the sense that we recognise that we're not the only leader or leaders within the school context. There's people exercising different forms of leadership all the time across our communities in order to try and realise or bring about the changes that we're hoping to make for our community. So the question that kind of leads me on to is that to what extent do leaders actually understand or how do leaders enable the work of the school to reflect the values and the aspirations of the communities that we're serving. And that's what Lorenzo has already touched on, the complexity of trying to achieve that when we've got multiple communities that we're serving, professional groups that we're serving as well, diverse groups of students and families that have different aspirations, values and goals, as well as different experiences of the school system that will all impact and affect not just the vision that we have or the values that we're trying to withhold or trying to um, not withhold, but to establish for our community. That's not always going to be something that they're going to be able to connect with or necessarily recognize for themselves either. So I think where we start to get into notions of what makes effective leadership or ineffective leadership is about asking some of these hard questions about how do the decisions that I make with the decision-making authority that I have, given the named position of leadership that you might have, how do I use that to make sure that we're building a culture or a community that is cohesive, that is collaborative, that enables us not just to make sure the decisions we make reflect the diversity of our community, but how does it make sure that we ourselves, but also all of these constituent members and groups of our community can go through a collective sense-making process to try and understand, well, what is it that we're trying to achieve here? Who is it that's coming together to try and achieve this? What might that mean? And how does this add to the complexity of trying to negotiate what needs to change or improve? Or what it is that we're trying to achieve as well. And I think that this is where the role of all leaders within a school community is really important, whether it's our student leaders, whether it's the principal, whether it's our families that exercise leadership as influence, our leadership as a relational practice in lots of different ways in our community. They all frame the work that we do within a school. They all frame the decision-making processes, the, the possibilities of what come with the work that we do and what outcomes can result from it. They also, I think, are, are community builders. Someone once said to me about how every member of a school community is an architect of the school culture. And I thought that's so interesting, but can you imagine working with 900 architects building one community? And that's something that would be hugely problematic and hugely challenging. And that's what led me into looking at forms uh, as a leader in school and now from a research perspective as well, are what are the practical mechanisms and structures for collaborative approaches to school development? that would actually help us be architects collectively of the school culture and community through the practices that we're actually engaging in, whether that's our agreed and coherent, not necessarily consistent, but coherent approaches to learning and teaching, to student assessment, to student engagement, etc. These are all things that each of our constituent members of our communities are going to have views on and are going to have strong views on potentially, as well as experiences and expertise. So I think that ultimately trying to make sense of all of that and to distill that into one succinct point, it would be the, the leader is hugely important in cultivating collaborative approaches to school improvement and change. And how they do that is through supporting different sense-making processes across the community. So they understand the different knowledge that exists, the experiences that are there, but how we use that to actually achieve something great for the school community that we serve. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. Ruth, you're on. Thank you. Um, it's difficult to follow all of that really comprehensive ask, um, answers we've got there. So I'm just going to try and summarise from my own experience what it's like to work with effective and ineffective leaders, maybe just to think about it from that perspective. So where I've been fortunate enough to work for effective leaders, I think you can almost sense within the building a, a sense of there's a calm purposefulness, you know, there's a real kind of sense of we know where we're going as a community um, through a, a vision which the others have spoken about, which is really clear, but it's not just one which is written down or your motto or 
you know, a little slogan. It, it's something you see in the daily interactions between staff members, between staff and students, between staff and parents as well. I think it, it comes through in the way that leaders think about the design of their building and how, how is the building going to work for us? Um, it's in the design of the day-to-day -day curriculum that, that's being delivered, not just the content, but, you know, all those little bits which allow you to build a vision for what you want as children. So it's kind of focusing on the big picture, but also on that minutiae, which makes the school their own. Um, I think for me, effective leaders have always been the ones who are really, um, display really keen emotional and social intelligence. They're really able to adapt their style depending on the context very quickly. They often have a sense of calm in themselves as well when they're effective so that when there are those challenges, which in schools they come often and they come without any warning, they can handle it and they know that they can trust their staff too. Um, I thought, I think also particularly, a lot of you picked up, how do people relate to their school community? And um, for me in particular, where I worked in London, building positive relationships with the parents and the parent community, which, you know, lots of them were living in very challenging circumstances and, and relationships with schools weren't always formed from their own experience in, on positive basis. So how do we build relationships with parents so that we're working together as a team for the children? Um, one thing I remember, just even just very small things, things like a, a leader I worked for was always on the school gate every single morning, every single evening, rain or sun or snow and, and mainly rain in, in England, mainly rain. But that kind of connection with the community to A, make sure they're having those positive interactions with parents, with the children, smiling, welcome, make a huge difference. I would also say though, I have been fortunate and I do mean fortunate because I think I've learned a lot to work with and for ineffective leaders. Um, and I think you can learn a huge amount from them. And where I've seen ineffective leaders, it's where I believe they've succumbed to the pressures on them of the external systems, whether that's around accountability or their concerns around budgets or the fact that they're perhaps a little bit disconnected from the experiences of their teaching staff. Perhaps they haven't been in the classroom and out and about for a long period of time and don't really realize when they, when they say, oh, just another thing, what that means for the teachers and what that means for their workload as well. Um, so I think sometimes, when, again, when I see ineffective leaders, they seek results at the expense of thinking about reflection on their goals, the expense of their well-being of their community, and in the worst cases, at expense of their moral compass as well and can behave in, you know, in unethical ways. And at the very worst, I've seen ineffective leaders drive teachers out of the system and fail to really serve their community. So I think ineffective leaders, not great that they're there, but when we see them, we can learn a lot from them that can shape how we, and when we become school leaders, change our practice. And I'll leave it. Thank you so much, Ruth. And I want to thank all of our panelists for your uh, responses to this question. Lots of themes we heard over and over. Certainly, we heard the theme of creating uh, a culture and really um, being very intentional about uh, developing that culture all throughout the, the school context. Uh, we heard a lot about listening, listening to the various stakeholders or the uh, many communities within the larger community of the school and not just listening, but also building the leadership capacity of all of the individuals that are part of the school um, and really empowering everyone who is within the school to co-create uh, the culture and the vision and the excellence of the school. Uh, um, and also recognizing that that also involves a lot of diverse perspectives and conflict and navigating through the differences and through the conflict to come to where are the commonalities and where is the shared experience and the shared vision and expectations for the school. Uh, and that ultimately, as I think Lorenzo said, that comes very much down to trust building. Um, and so thank you all. I know I didn't capture everything, but I think those were extremely insightful responses. We'll move on now to another challenging question uh, in regard to these recent years of disruption and difficult working conditions that have uh, been experienced uh, in schools. Education is arguably in a state of crisis with high staff attrition and burnout among teachers and school leaders. 
what steps can school communities, education leaders, and policymakers take to improve educators' working conditions, job satisfaction, and professional status? How can schools better support a new generation of teachers and leaders and create more attractive career paths in the wake of the pandemic? And recognizing that this is a rather large question, I'm going to encourage you to just focus on maybe one or two suggestions that uh, our uh, listeners can uh, try and, and implement. Uh, and we'll start uh, this time with Lorenzo. That's a very good question. And actually, I'm glad you're asking that question, that this question is part of the, uh, of the list of questions that uh, you, we want us to focus on. So, yes, um, I believe that an effective leader is the one who adapts to new reality. Uh, it's all focused on adaptive leadership. Uh, prior to uh, 2019, um, you know, I'm gonna just, you know, talk about my experience. I'm sure that each context is different, each country is different. Uh, and but prior to 2019, we would hire teachers. We would, you know, and we would bring teachers in our school district. They would be extremely happy. I'm joining this and that. Something happens along the way where now, as a school leader, is always I always believe that as a school leader you need to be you know empathetic, uh, really understand what you know educators are coming from, uh, try to meet their needs, uh, talk to them in a way that uh, you balance the social emotional uh, state of mind, and you embrace them, you welcome on board. But now it's getting to a point that when they, they sh you hire people, you, they sh do show up in your school. You got to be ultra empathetic because otherwise uh, you will hire them one day and a week later or two weeks later, they find a job somewhere else, they leave. So there's not um, this sense of I'm getting this great job as a teacher, I'm staying, this and that. There are great districts, great, I mean, great districts around us, like for, for example, Boston who offers and pay a little bit more. And uh, sometimes they make that choice and they go there. But teacher shortage, uh, also is a major uh, factor um, in our country. So um, this has, you know, in my view, has to do with a bad, bad, bad policies that comes from, uh, I would say, higher ed to uh, um, districts and also through the policies that have been here for so long um, that, you know, I, I'm not sure the policy is too intentional. It was never intentional. You hire people, whoever comes on the net, you hire them, you put them in school without really understand the demographic shifts uh, in our school district. Kids from different countries, parents from different countries, you know, you have to be able to meet their individual needs. ESL students, for example, who come to your district without, without any English background. Uh, the kids that come into your district as a refugee, for example, uh, you know, uh, crossing the border, the Mexico border into the U.S. So you have to have teachers in the classroom really understand where they're coming from and meet them where they are. I don't think we, as as a school system, we have done a good job uh, over the years uh, because of many reasons. One could be the English-only movement. The second one, the other factor could be this idea that you have everyone has to adjust to the mainstream culture and uh, basically operating from a you know from a deficit uh, a deficit perspective where your English your language your experience will not count. There's a lot of things here to unpack and to talk about. So I would say that as school leaders, our job is to take those realities, capitalize on those realities, learn from those realities, talk to people, and really understand where they're coming from and be very, very empathetic towards kids, towards parents, towards teachers, so that you can understand where they're coming from. Model your leadership on that experience, and that modeling has to be done in a way that it shows that you, you every day you're growing, you are advancing, you are developing, you are adjusting your leadership to new realities that we have on the ground. So without that, it's just impossible. Here we are talking about, you know, 20 of uh, 70% of our kids are kids from other countries. If you don't adapt your leadership, then you will not be able to function. So it's impossible to really navigate, you know, a, 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 you know, a culture that where you have 
a lot of kids from different countries without disregarding their culture, disregarding the experience, and then try to impose them the American culture, the American view. It's just impossible. You cannot do that. So I would say that you got to adapt to new reality, bringing more teachers, create incentive for minority teachers, teachers of color that has to be have to be in the classroom to support our kids. And actually, the research is quite strong about that. You know, they found out that just, you know, a student, if you have one teacher of color over the periods from elementary to high school, the likelihood for you to really succeed at the high school and beyond is very strong. And they did just the same research indicated that a student who had at least two teachers of color throughout the his, his or her entire trajectory in education all the way up to um, high school and beyond, you know, had a very successful rate in terms of graduation after high school. So it's quite evident because obviously, you know, there are the teaching force is not diversified. And unfortunately, we don't have the teacher capacity to do respond effectively to teachers of color, kids of color and minority, other minority students. So those are the things I'd like to share with you. I'm sure you got some of those realities in your country and your, you know, in your context, but this is coming from what I see, what I've done, and the trend that is out there in the field. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. I would love to have Ruth respond to the question next. Thank you. Um, yeah, this, this question really hit home for me. I left school leadership just after the pandemic and certainly I don't think I realized until I did leave um, my, my job there that actually I probably was burning out as well um, during that with the time that needs to recover. Um, England has a real problem with workload and burnout and in, even before the pandemic we were losing teachers and school leaders at a really high rate. Um, teaching is not seen as a job which is sustainable over a career for people, certainly not until retirement at, at the moment. And that for me is really problematic. Um, and it, it's such a shame as well, because there has been some brilliant work going on in England around instructional leadership, focus on evidence-informed practice, really trying to develop our teaching practice here. But all of that is being lost as schools are spending their time at the moment firefighting um, social issues due to just chronic underinvestment in the types of services which support children and families. Schools really are the last place of resort because they're the one place where children have to go to uh, in, in the community. So it, it's in schools where they're, we're not just trying to deal with teaching, we're also trying to deal with all those social issues. Um, I think we've seen, again, you know, there's been cuts in other services, but there's been cuts in, in teaching spending as well, in the education system. And that directly impacts not just the students, but the teachers who are left. Um, and I think one of the things we have to be really careful about is the kind of narrative, which I think is quite dangerous about these hero teachers who are always going above and beyond um, their job role, despite their difficulties. I do think we have to start as school leaders pushing back on that and saying, hang on, this isn't, this isn't sustainable. We can't all be heroes the whole time. This needs to be a sustainable job. Um, you can't address instructional issues when your house is on fire. You just can't. So I think at the moment, for me, the big issue is continuing to use our unions to fight for better pay and working conditions. But for school leaders and educational leaders to be talking about and making noise about the unrealistic expectation on schools and why we need investment in wider services in society. Because if you can address those things, School leaders and teachers can spend more time on the instructional issues, on not just having to catch up and, um, you know, really investing in professional development of the staff. We just don't have the capacity to do that at the moment. So for me, it's it's sadly around money and investment in services is a big issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Ruth. Rupa, I'd like to invite you to respond to the question. Um, so for me and the country that I come from, we, um, we are seeing slowly that teaching once that was a noble profession is weaning out. And just like as um, Lorenzo said, we need to readjust to the new reality. We see that the young graduates are not interested in teaching anymore. Um, Upon inquiring, we are all alarmed at what we get as our results. The results are very clear. 
we need to overall the whole ecosystem in our school if we need to attract talents good talents that are going away for corporate jobs or whatever be their calling now we tried with better pay that didn't work because teachers are very clear better pay is not exactly what they are looking at so what are they looking at they're looking at they're looking at a purpose that is compelling for them to come to school every day they're looking at a culture in the school where the workload is balanced well and it's not it's not a, a way where one teacher shoulders the responsibility of three and at the end of the day she's got no work-life balance they're looking at a school that gives them enough um, professional development empower themselves and the school policies should be framed in a way where these young graduates and the and the and the middle-aged teachers are you know they need exposure they need to go out they need to be there with their colleagues networking and collaborating and sharing of ideas now that gives them a kind of validation of their skills um, making their presence felt outside the school which often i'm sorry to say um, we can't afford because uh, you know going out for a day for seminars is fine normally after this pandemic the school leaders would prefer you do it online that's it um, but they don't like that they would like to meet colleagues outside um, understand what's happening in that part of the world and get back with a different sense of purpose so in my mind I think the burnout in our country is more to do with um, an imbalance in the workload and a purpose to which they are unable to connect. So we need to repurpose, rebrand this education, teaching as a, a wonderful profession. It should not be considered the last option that somebody didn't find. Young uh, men and women, they, they, they are just not bothered you know we try to bring them in they they're not bothered because of these reasons even when the school doesn't have an eight hour shift we come early and we leave early regardless of the system the policies and the overalling will have to change to adapt the new reality and the new reality is that people are not always just running for money or more money can lure them it is the other factors which requires to be connected with their soul and the burnout aspect of the school has come around more prominent post covid because post covid we all know how much we suffered physically mentally so schools must be mindful when they set the timetable for the day when they when they have their you know accountability raised and ask ask more with very little um, I mean when I say little it's resources basically and we ask that you need to finish this and you need to do that with this paucity of time and paucity of resources and yet be a rock star that's asking too much because the teacher after all is not a robot it's a human being and human being will definitely have their human challenges moods emotions which the schools sadly do not quite take into consideration. So the school that I worked, and I just left now last year, we introduced something called mindful meditation just to give them this time out that you get burnt out, you get so, you get so much um, ruffled. The, the presence of mind and the balance of mind is so, so important to deal with kids. So it's important that in the morning when we meet and we don't get into the staff room for a chatter, what we need to do is to collect ourselves and our energies with our soul so that mindful meditation works beautifully um, and everybody in the community will have to do, even the leader does it. It's not a part of the policy, but I thought, because I'm into mindful meditation past 20 years, and I thought that if I could keep myself 
in a state of calm and poise, even when there is fire all around. I think each of them can also invite that. And that worked, I must say. So mindful meditation is one practice we can all start in our schools. Being an IB principal, I went to a school in France and I saw that they brought in this, this particular practice in their school. So eight o'clock, there's no assembly. It's mindful meditation. You sit there in a the state of calm before you get burnt out the whole day dealing with children, their errant behavior and the workload and whatnot and whatnot a teacher goes through. So I think the way to retain these talents, these young people, is to repurpose and rebrand this profession. The profession is slowly losing its sheen and it's not it's not the one that we knew before. The respect has gone. But of course, much to do is with the parents. In India, I must tell you about what's happening in this country. Parents have become over demanding, over expectation. And that puts a pressure on the school management, the head of the school, the teachers, and everybody. When they put their child in your care, they expect everything a to Z from the school. And this over-demanding parents is because of the new economy that India is now in, or has emerged into. And so parents think that, okay, when I put my child in a school that has an international curriculum, the, ch the child will be looked after from A to Z, everything the teacher needs to do, which is impossible to meet their demand. So the burnout gets too much into their head. And that's where I brought in the mindful practice, mindful meditation. Okay. Thank you so much. So much. I think we seem to be being. Uh, Thank you so much uh, to uh, Rupa, and we have time for Paul to. Yeah, Paul, do you want to answer that question? I'm, I'm not sure if everybody else is having the same experience with yeah. Audrey's. Okay, yeah, over to you, Paul. Thank you. No, I'll give a brief response because I think, I mean, it's been very comprehensively covered and I think that I could have just said I'll follow on from Ruth's answer in particular as well because the one word that I'd written down in response when that question was asked was funding and I'll come back to why I kind of chose that but I think the first thing is, and kind of linking with what Rupa shared just now as well, was where we need to reflect on what does it mean to be an educator now? And I think that it wasn't just because of COVID, I think before we were seeing the increase in demands and the complexity of the knowledge that was required for school educators to be able to respond to the diverse needs that were being presented within communities to be able to respond to. And I think that these demands were already increasing prior to the pandemic and it's just become even more intense um, after the pandemic as well. So it's about reflecting on what is it that we're actually demanding, not just of educators, but of schools more broadly, and how well equipped are they to be able to make informed responses to these challenges as well. One of the things that if someone was to give me a shopping list while I was still in school, it would be I would like an education psychologist, a counsellor and a social worker on site. The majority of my workload, despite having a remit for learning, teaching and assessment, was child protection and safeguarding or pastoral concerns. And by having the support of an education psychologist, a counsellor and a social worker on site who are recognised members of the community, it would enable us to respond to the needs that our students are presenting or the needs of our community in a much more efficient, effective and meaningful way, but also in a way that's reflective of the complexity of the needs that our children and young people face, that we are not fully equipped nor have the expertise sufficiently to be able to respond to in a way that will truly meet their needs, which is why it leads me to the point on funding. If we don't fund our school systems in a way that enables school communities to respond to the needs that are being presented, 
we're not going to be able to meet needs. We're not going to achieve these excellent outcomes that we all aspire to. But also, we're going to just continue to go through a cycle of burnout for educators, for school leaders, and dissatisfaction within our communities and our society more broadly in terms of how the school system is actually performing. But it does take us back again to that question. I think every panelist has asked so far about what does it mean to be an educator? How does the job of being a teacher or a school leader enable individuals to connect back with a broader sense of purpose? I think the majority of educators, if they don't necessarily go in to the profession with a moral purpose or a sense of duty, they develop it over time. But to what extent does the job actually enable them to fulfil that sense of duty or that moral obligation or the values that they, they live by? Frequently, you speak to educators and teachers, and the thing that they talk about is the fact they want to contribute to society. They want to make things better for the community that they're serving. But if that is being driven by market-driven accountability mechanisms within schools that don't reflect the broader aspirations and values of the work of teachers, they're not going to feel satisfied or a sense of fulfillment from the job they're doing within the school communities. And that's going to lead to teachers and school leaders to looking for other avenues of how they can contribute to society in much more sustainable, but also much more meaningful ways. So I think we have to look at how the processes of not just accountability, but how we verify the success of work at schools is actually done within systems. And you'll frequently hear, and I've heard lots of times, system leaders at different levels of systems saying it's not about systems, it's about the practice that's happening in school communities. But I would always challenge that. It's always about systems. Systems frame the work that is possible, not just the work that does happen, the work that's even possible within our school communities. And until we start taking a broader systems view to challenge what's actually happening in terms of how teachers and educators, as well as our students and families, experience the school system, then we're not going to bring about change or develop a profession that people want to be a part of. I think that one other thing I would add to my shopping list that we don't have time to go into would also be looking at varied career paths for educators. Professional review and development processes I've gone through with colleagues that I was working with in the previous few years, when they realized, actually, I've got really good skills in counseling, or I want to learn more about education psychology, or I'd like to work with the community more broadly outside of a school. We should be able to support and have pathways that enable educators to pursue different career paths, whether that's early on, midway through, or towards the end of a career as well. And again, that would take funding, whether that's for further study, and further study that doesn't just include paying your fees, but actually enabling time for that as part of their working week to go and pursue and contribute to our communities and society in a different way as well. We can't hear you, Audrey, I'm afraid. So, um, yeah, um, you can keep on trying to, to join and then I'll, I'll just keep move things moving forward. Um, so obviously we, we've got seven minutes left. Thank you everybody for answering that question, which was a huge question. <laughs> I don't know that we could have probably spoke, you know, all day about that one, but um, we've got seven minutes left. So we do have a couple more questions and I think it's gonna be quite difficult to get through both these questions with everybody answering. So I might just sort of break it up a little bit for the next few minutes and then that will leave us time for the, the, the um, attendees questions at the end. So there is a question that we wanted to get out there about the different sort of models, schools of thought around effective education leadership. So, you know, for example, transformational leadership, instructional leadership and so on. I will ask, you, you know, who would like to take this question very briefly, if there are any particularly interesting models that you support, um, and if you can talk a little bit about that and why that would be. Does anybody have a burning desire to answer this one? I can. Paul? Yeah, okay, a couple of minutes, if that's okay. I'll be really brief and just to start off with the I think my response to this would maybe be not necessarily a controversial one, but I'll say it's a controversial one because I say there isn't one in my view. I think that what I think is really important about this question is the fact that we've got lots of different models and typologies and theoretical frameworks around leadership that help us understand what might constitute effective leadership. But I think one of the key I think lessons that I've come to understand and will continue evolving in my understanding of is the fact that there isn't one that necessarily can fit leaders, schools, communities, and contexts. I think 
if you were to try and take out some broader principles from these different theories and frameworks of leadership, it would be looking at concepts of well, democratic principles, I guess, or agency and empowerment, or even the role of power within that. I think that if we're looking at really effective models or theories of leadership, it would start off with how we actually live those concepts. And for me, it starts off with something I think, Ruth, you mentioned earlier, was about the leader that is at the front door every single day or at the front gate at the start and the end of the day. They're there ready to listen, to find out what's actually happening in the community, what the needs might be, and actually think about, well, what's the purpose of them being there? How are they gonna use that? How do they support a process of coming to know what's happening within their community, what the aspirations, goals, and needs might be, and how do they then design practices and norms of working within their community that reflect action towards that? And at times that might be forms of distributed leadership that you know, pass on power and the agency needed to be able to action things in different ways by different people within the community. Sometimes it will take a transformational stance of one position school leader that has a named responsibility within the community to bring about something different. But I think the real effective and meaningful approaches to leadership that could be exercised by many leaders in the community is someone that can take time to understand what do I want to achieve, what do I value, how does that connect with the community that I'm serving, and then how do I bring that to life through the practicalities of what we do as a school community every single day. Does anybody have anything they'd like to add to that I before add, we look at? I yeah. I, if, if I may, um, it's going to be two seconds. I will just echo what uh, Paul uh, just said. But I, uh, throughout my career as a, as a leader, I tend to, um, you know, focus a little bit more on transformative leadership and instructional leadership. Both of those two leaderships echo to my style and model uh, my behavior on that because it's essentially a transformational leader is the one who really builds trust within the community is out there is a community builder um you and basically use a lot of innovations you there supporting your people you know you are charismatic people you build relationships um and then you move your agenda forward i think um i also believe that you need to be instructional leader you need to understand the curriculum development how to develop how to prepare teachers how to build teacher capacity how to support your those who are dean and out day in day out they are in front of the kids and you really need to be a community builder, understand parents, welcome them, and really be enthusiastic and really take on the challenges that you know you feel that others would not change would not take. And most importantly, build a community that really you know focus on trust and development. That's the most important thing. If you are not a trusted leader, nothing gets done, and your work, your vision will fail. That's for sure. So I tend to model. My, time, my style of leadership on those two characteristics or two principles or the style, transformation and uh, instruction. Thank you. I am really conscious now that we've got two minutes left and that we also have questions from the panel. And one of the questions that we would have liked to um, present to the, uh, the panelists, but what I suggest we do is um, I will gather the thoughts um, from from the panel um, on the final question that I would have liked to have asked today, and we can circulate that in the email to all the uh, registrants afterwards. So that just gives us a minute to look at some of the questions that have been dropped into the um, the, the question box from the attendees today. Um, one that I would like to draw out is um, it's somebody somebody's made a comment, a kind of an observation, and they're just interested to see what your um, thoughts are on this. So they said, as a school leader, you must be flexible and see what's happening, act with tact and be consistent, and be also free, free, relaxed, and have humour. That breaks tension and opens dialogue so they're just interested to know what your thoughts are about that on the panel so Ruth can I direct this to you do you think humor helps I, I think humor does help and I have to say I probably have a, a kind of a dark sense of humor as well because so many things go wrong in schools that you need to be able to find your tribe you know of perhaps other school leaders as well that you can pick up the phone to and go what on earth is happening here and have those kind of conversations with trusty colleagues and networks um, Yep, all of those things are good, but I also think that we all we do have to remember there is a place and a time to be authoritative, to make really difficult decisions 
and stick with them. Uh, we can't, we want to be collaborative, but we can't always be collaborative. We can't always be humorous. We can't always be the nice person in the room. We have to be able to draw upon our moral and inner strength to say, you know what, actually, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this decision and it might make people uncomfortable, but it's the right decision. And, uh, and I'll follow that through too. So, yeah, you've got to have multiple personalities, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And be brave by the sound of it, sticking to your, yeah, yeah, to your, to your guns, really, yeah. So we've got some more questions, but I am conscious that we have it hit the, the hour now. So what I will do is in a follow-up email, I will, before we send that out, I will gather the, um, the thoughts from the panellists um, around those questions and send those in a follow-up email to everyone. So um, massive thank you to the panellists today. Um, it's been really interesting um, and thought-provoking actually hearing different viewpoints. Obviously, uh, lots of different experience here on the panel from different parts of the world. I hope that everybody who's joined us today has found it useful. The recording will also be sent on um, afterwards, so please feel free to share that with, um, with colleagues. Um, so thank you once again, and um, hopefully see you all again soon. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.